Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, well, we're gonna do something I haven't done in a little bit of time, and it's a PC archeology span episode. As you can see on the bench here, I have three IBM PCs. Well, I have one IBM PC, I think it's a 5150, and I have two clones. So in this video, well, I think we'll start with the 5150. I'll take it apart, we'll take a look inside, test it and stuff like that. And if it's uninteresting and that goes quickly, then I'll dive into these other machines. And if not, then I guess there'll be multiple parts. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Before I dig into the PC5150 here, let's just take a quick look at all three of the machines. So 5150 is a little bit dirty. It's got two of the uh, IBM branded Tandon five and a quarter inch disk drives in here. Very typical configuration. This was never actually sold from IBM with a hard drive. It was only a single or a dual floppy configuration. Looking at the back, it is apparent to me that this machine, well, is in pretty nice shape, except for the fact that's a little bit rusty on this cover right here. But this is one of the later or B variants of this machine, which means it's gonna have a 64 to 256K motherboard in it, as opposed to the original 16K to 64K motherboards. The big distinction when you look at the back of those computers to tell them apart is the number of screw holes that are holding the top cover on. This later variant has five holes holding the cover on, while I'm pretty sure the original A variant has only two, or maybe it has four. I can't remember, but there are less screws on that earlier one. Looking at the badge on the back confirms that the computer is a 5150 and it says it's made in the United States. As is typical for 5150s, you have a keyboard and a cassette port. The reason for the cassette port is they actually sold a version of this that didn't even have any internal floppy drives and you would use an external cassette drive to save your basic programs onto. Well, at least that was the idea. If you bought one of these machines with only 64K of RAM or even 16K of RAM, it was impossible to actually run DOS as an operating system, so all you could do is turn it on and go into the built-in basic, which is in ROM, and then save to the external cassette drive. I'm not sure how many machines IBM sold like that though, and I think pretty much all of them had floppy drives, so this port went completely unused. Looking at the back at the cards we have installed, a giveaway that this is a 5150, which of course the badges show, is it only has five slots. The XT, which is the 5160 and onward, had eight slots, and pretty much all clones and 286s and things had eight slots as well, eight or more slots. Starting from the left, we have this large D sub connector here. This is for the floppy drive interface, and it would be for hooking up an external floppy drive. This machine actually supports four floppy drives, although I've never actually seen a configuration like that, but I know that it is actually supported by the dip switches on the motherboard. We have another rusty slot cover here. We have game port, we have a parallel port, we have a serial port, and then we have what looks like an EGA card because CGA cards only have one of these RCA type connectors. This has two and a set of dip switches here. So this most likely is some kind of an EGA card, which is quite fancy for an original 5150. This would have been added later because when this machine came out, the EGA card was not yet an option. You could get either CGA or monochrome. Next up is the clone that's sitting underneath the 5150 and it has a badge here that says Precision XT. And oddly it has, well, looks like space for a badge here, but I don't know why that's not in there. I guess uh, this actually looks a little bit too big to fit in that spot. So I don't know what the deal is with this yellow here. It is interesting though that this is a very blatant clone of the IBM 5150 or 5160. Not sure what this is modeled after. The fact that it says XT implies that this was actually modeled after the 5160. But the 5160 has an identical front panel to it as the 5150, well, except for the badge of course. And this, while it's very similar, it has a little bit of a ridge that goes around the entire front bezel. But otherwise, from a color and a texture and an angle and every other look about it, it's basically identical. From a floppy perspective, there is one five and a quarter inch half height drive here, and then we have three blank panels. There may be hard drives hiding behind those. We'll find out when I finally open this machine up. I wanted to point out the side of these machines because this is the IBM 5150 here, and you can see the depth of the machine is, well, typical for an IBM, but this clone is actually deeper by a little bit, which is a bit unusual. I figure they would have just replicated the internal structure of the IBM exactly. On the back of the machine here, it looks pretty run of the mill. It's a little bit rusty. This thing is not in the best shape. We have a badge here that says powered by Speedpak 286 Victor. 
Does that mean this thing has some kind of accelerator in it? I'm definitely curious to see what's in here. Moving over to the slot area, we have a normal keyboard connector, a hole that's missing, and then we have a video card here, which is probably gonna be monochrome or CGA potentially, but probably monochrome. We have a parallel port, another parallel port, and we have a serial port. So not a lot going on inside this machine, at least on the back. And then we have the bottom machine. Now this is obviously a clone. It's not a, a name brand machine and it is not obviously a direct carbon copy of the well, IBM 5150 or 5160 because the design language is a little bit different. But actually the design language of this machine looks much more similar to the design language on the original IBM PC AT, the 5170, which here is my 5170. And the big differentiator on this is of course, it has two exposed drive bays. And I think it has space for a third drive, like a hard drive down the bottom here, and actually has another bay over here behind the bezel for a full height hard drive. Well, you could put two things in there, but the original configuration was a full height MFM type hard drive. And part of me suspects, and we'll find this out when we finally open this up, that there's room inside here for a full height hard drive or two half height hard drives. I don't think there's room underneath the two drive bays here for uh, a hard drive though. There's just not enough space with the bottom of the computer. But as you can see in there now, it has a half height five and a quarter inch disk drive on the top. And then it has what looks like a Seagate or other MFM hard drive on the bottom. Unlike any actual IBM though, we have a reset and a turbo button and a couple LEDs. The 5170 introduced the key lock switch on the front of the machine and it had a couple LEDs for power and hard drive, but none of the IBMs ever had a reset or turbo switch. Inside the little badge space there, there is some kind of a symbol. I don't recognize it directly, but maybe it matches whatever the company is, which we might see looking at the back. On the back, everything is pretty run of the mill. There is a badge here that may be a little hard to read because of the reflection in it, but it says Lind Technology, assembled in the USA. And there is an FCC ID. Interesting that this was actually a US clone maker, but almost assuredly all of the parts that were used on this machine came from overseas. Not a whole lot going on over here in the slot area. We have the keyboard connector, serial port, game port. This is almost certainly the video port, probably monochrome again or CGA. And then we have a parallel port. I repositioned the camera because I wanted to show that there is a lot of gross stuff in here. I think this is pet hair probably, like a dog or something like that, that has accumulated in this machine over time. From a PC clone perspective, this bottom case was incredibly common, at least from my recollection. I saw a lot of these XTs and 286 clones with a, this exact case or one that was very similar to this. The look of this clone wasn't unheard of. It just was less common, I think, because it was such a blatant copy of IBM's design language. At least this was, well, slightly different, especially for an XT. And I wouldn't be surprised if they designed this later one to give you the illusion that it was a 286 when the reality was it was an XT inside. Someone who might not be so trained on IBM's actual computers might look at this top one and say, oh, that's just an XT, even if this had a 286 in it. But they might look at this and mistake it for a 286, even though it had an XT in it. Alrighty, that's the quick tour of the outside of these machines. Let me clear the bench and we'll get to opening up the one on the top. Now, on all these old IBMs up until, I guess, the PS2, when they had metal cases, they used flat blade screws, but they were also hex head, which means you can use a tool like this with a little socket in them to undo them. Now, the funny thing is, these two tools I've had since high school. I remember buying myself a little tool kit, and it came with these in there, and I always wondered, what are these used for, like these two hex heads? Because all the clone computers I ever worked on used a normal Phillips head screw, so I just used a Phillips screwdriver. But then it turned out when I started working on more retro computers much later, like this is more recently, that I found that these two tools here are the exact size for all of the screws that IBM used on the 5160, 5150, and the 5170. But it's just funny that I always wondered when I was young what these were for, and it took until probably five years ago until I finally realized that these nut drivers were specifically designed for IBM's machines. Okay, so the screws are out. Let's slide the cover off. And this is kind of the moment of truth. I'm always worried when I open these things up. Well, there's two things. It's kind of cool and interesting to see like what kind of cool things might be installed in here. It might be run of the mill, might be nothing special, or there might be some really cool rare cards in here. But the thing that worries me the most is this might have a RAM multi IO function type card that has a clock battery on it. And as is normal for those NICAD type batteries, they leak and they destroy things. So while you might not think that this is gonna have battery damage because it's an older machine, it wouldn't have a clock. Those were very frequently added in 
And this thing does have some expansion cards in it, so let's see if anything has gone terribly wrong inside. Just lift up slightly as you slide it forward. All right, so on first blush, nothing looks terribly wrong inside of this thing. I don't see massive corrosion. I don't see a mouse nest or anything like that. It all looks pretty good. Well, you can see right here, we have the two standard tanned in five and a quarter inch disc drives. These are OEM'd by IBM, but they have the same problem with the levers that can break. Obviously, neither of these are broken, but they're probably on the verge of breaking. We can see that these are both double-sided drives because there's two connectors here and here. I think the very earliest IBMs actually came with single-sided drives. This blue ribbon cable though is the standard affair. This is what IBM put in their machines and this is definitely the IBM floppy drive controller right here. We have a power supply that is not the original IBM power supply. This is an XT power supply, but it has definitely been swapped out. Our first card is the EGA card. Obviously this is not an IBM EGA card. This is a later clone one. I think it would have 64K of RAM here and it says, EGA Superior, but the chip in the middle here says PEGA 1A, so that would be a Paradise EGA, well, main chipset. Not sure if this is a Paradise card itself, but whoever made it used the Paradise EGA chip, which took all of the complicated logic on the IBM EGA card and all those custom chips and stuck it all down into this one IC. The date codes on some of these IC are from 1986, but I think the date code on this is from 1987. So this was definitely a late addition to this machine, which might have been originally sold in 1983. And incidentally, I can see right here on the disk drive, like 1983 uh, date code. So this machine is at least from 1983 or later. Alrighty, next up is this multi IO card. And this is the one that might have a battery on it that may have leaked and damaged the computer. Ah, okay, it does have a battery, but it's a CR2032. It looks like it's bulged a little bit. I have heard that it's possible that these can leak. And this one is definitely bulging, but it doesn't look like any kind of leakage has come out of this thing. So that's good. So looking at this board, it says IO plus right here. It does have some extra connectors here for additional ports, but you notice these unpopulated ICs here. That would be for like adding a second serial port, for instance, or something like that. Looking on the back of the card, it does have a built-in serial port, which is almost certainly this IC right here. This will be the UART. And then this is the parallel and that is the game port. Unfortunately, one of the biggest problems with these cards is they don't usually have any kind of silkscreen markings on them to tell you what these jumpers do. So if you wanna reconfigure ports and stuff, it's not always easy unless you can find the actual documentation for the card. But I have never really had good luck with that because other than it saying IO plus on here, there's really no other markings that I can notice anywhere except made in Taiwan there. Okay, and I actually take it back that obviously I said there was not many markings when clearly there's a sticker right here. It says IOP100, which IO plus is probably the model number. So IOP100 and there's an FCC ID, which I'll read out because it may not be readable in the camera. E305NTIOP100. So we probably look that up and figure out at least who makes this thing. Removing those cards gave us a look at the motherboard. And this is the original IBM motherboard. And it says right there, 64K to 256K. Now, normally when these motherboards are in their stock configuration, that means you can only have 256K on the motherboard. There's 64K soldered in this bank right here, and then you have three additional banks. The thing is 256K is not a whole lot. You can't really do that much with DOS, especially with an EGA card, which was in here. And the multi IO card that we took out didn't have extra RAM on it. So that leads me to believe that this thing actually may have a 640K installed on it, which was not an uncommon upgrade. You would leave the 64K on the motherboard, this is another 64K, and you do a little bit of a modification of the motherboard to allow you to install 256K by one chips in these two banks. They have the exact same pinout, there's really just an extra address line that allows you to uh, address the additional space. Now before we even turn this computer on, it's pretty easy to tell if that's been done with this machine because you just have to look at the RAM chips that are in here and we'll be able to see if that's the case. The soldered chips are NEC chips, but then we have the dreaded MT RAM chips, part number 4264, and that is the same part number in all three banks. That means that while well, this thing only has 256K, and it also means that, well, there's a good chance that this MT RAM is bad because we all know, well, if you watch my channel, how unreliable MT RAM is. Now let's get to testing this computer. Unfortunately, 5160 motherboards are notorious for shorted tantalum caps. These little yellow things here are tantalum caps. And unlike electrolytic caps, which can leak and damage things, what happens with these when they fail is they go short. And the early 80s ones are notorious for this problem, although it can happen on later ones as well. It seems to be extra prevalent 
on these types of machines. I've worked on multiple 5150s, and that has been the problem always, is these tantalums, they go bad. And typically it seems to be the ones on the 12 volt rail that goes bad, and that keeps the power supply from powering up the machine, or if you don't have a very good power supply that detects the overload, it can actually burn traces on the board or cause a little bit of a smoke show when one of them blows up. If you have a power supply that is not the best, like who knows how good this aftermarket one is here, it may not detect the rail being shorted and it could try to deliver a ton of current into it, which could burn a trace on the motherboard or cause a little tantalum cap to emit a little bit of smoke and a little bit of sparks and stuff. I've done repairs previously on machines just like this that had a shorted tantalum, where I go over exactly how to find the tantalum and replace it and stuff like that. So I will link to those videos in the description below. For this one, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna unplug the power supply and then I'm going to get my multimeter and we're gonna like do some testing just really quick. To do this testing, you set your multimeter into continuity mode where you have a beep, and you're gonna test between the black wires, well, the pins on the motherboard where the black wires go, which are ground, to all of the other colored wires. If any of those are shorted, where the continuity on the multimeter is close to zero ohms, then that means there's probably a tantalum that's bad. If you see like three or four ohms on a five volt rail especially, that's okay. That's just the, lo the load of all the chips and stuff. But it's like 0 0.5 ohms or less, that's where you have a problem. Okay, everything looks good, and we're getting 33 ohms between the red wire and the black wire, which is the 5 volt rail, which is completely normal for this machine. For simplicity of testing, I'm just going to use this VGA card here. It's an 8-bit card. I'm not going to use the EGA card because uh, that would imply grabbing another monitor. So if I'll just get a flat screen monitor, it's quicker and easier. You know, it would help if I actually grabbed a VGA card and not another EGA card. There's a VGA card right there. I don't want to power it up with the motherboard connected because who knows how long it's been since this thing's actually been turned on. So I'm gonna leave it unplugged from the motherboard and unplug it from the two floppy drives. And then I'm gonna plug in a sacrificial device like this old Seagate drive here. This is the one that I recently tested on a video where it doesn't actually work. It spins and seems to work, but it doesn't actually respond to anything. So if something is catastrophically wrong on this power supply, I don't want to go and potentially damage these disk drives because these tandem disk drives aren't exactly the most common thing in the world. So I'd rather them survive if this power supply is completely broken. Power up the power supply, and I'm gonna quickly check on the hard drive here if it starts to spin, that the five and the 12 volt rail are within like tolerance. It's not gonna be perfect because there's not enough load on this power supply without the motherboard and stuff like that, but it shouldn't be like really out of whack where like the five volts is eight volts or something like that. And in that case, it might have damaged the hard drive anyways. On the connector here, the pin that's furthest away from me is 12 volts, and the one closest to me is 5 volts. So we're going to turn this on. Well, the hard drive sounds like it's spinning up okay. 5.08, that looks good. And 12.1, okay. So both rails seem fine, and the hard drive is acting like it normally does, which is doesn't work that well. All right, the power supply is reconnected to the motherboard. I still have the floppy drives disconnected. Let's turn this on. Oh, power supply didn't start there. That would imply that either one of the tantalums has just shorted, which is definitely quite possible, or there is something wrong with that power supply and it just cannot supply enough current. What I'm gonna do here is we're gonna quickly test for shorts on this connector right here, which just happens to be sitting there. 12 volts, that is no short. And for five volts, we're at 34 ohms, so that's the same as before. But one of the other rails could have shorted on here. There's like a minus five volts and a minus 12 as well. So I'll just quickly test those. Yeah, no, everything seems completely fine with those other rails. So that kind of leads me to believe that there's something wrong with this power supply. While I powered up the hard drive properly, once the load of the entire system was on it, it was unhappy. So I'm just gonna grab another power supply for my test bench and we'll plug that into the motherboard and just uh, see if this thing is working. All right, the bench power supply, which I know works really well, it's plugged into the motherboard and I plugged it into the two floppy drives. Let's power this on. No, that didn't work either. I must say that I'm a little perplexed that this one went into shutdown as well. That does imply that we do have a short on the board and I don't understand why the multimeter wasn't actually finding it. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove the floppy drive controller because it also has tantalums on it. Those can go short as well. And let's see if that helps the situation at all. All right, there's the IBM floppy drive controller. We'll just stick that off to the side here. Let's see what happens. Okay, 
So it turned on, it ran for a second, and then it went into shutdown. So that does imply there is a problem on this motherboard. I gotta say, I'm not surprised about this at all. This is such a common issue with these IBM 5150s. So if you're looking to buy one of these, please know that this is probably gonna happen and you're gonna need to know how to switch out the caps. We'll figure out which cap is bad and then swap it out. Now I'm sitting here thinking, how am I gonna figure out what the bad cap is? Because we don't have a total short. The computer does kind of run a little bit and then it seems to shut off. So either an IC has gone bad on here or one of those caps is, is starting to short out. And on this power supply, it's very close to tripping the short circuit protection. Now, of course, this power supply is much more powerful than this built-in one here. This thing is only like 60 some watts. And this is, I don't know, 135 watts or even a 200 watt power supply. So that's why it probably runs a little bit longer before it kind of turns itself off. Now, I think what I'm gonna do is something I don't think I've done on this channel before, and I'm gonna use the thermal camera to try to figure out which cap on here is getting hot so I can just cut it out. All right, so this is an iPad. I have a Fleur 1 connected to it. Camera's working. Um, I have to charge up the battery. This thing is not very reliable. I've had it for a good number of years, and the battery inside is, is failing, I think. This particular one is pretty low resolution, but it's good enough for us to kind of see what's going on. So I'm gonna hit record. And I'm gonna turn on the computer and let's see if I can see anything. Okay, I can see it right there. You see that? Got very, very hot right down there. But I'm gonna wager it's this one right here that I have the pointing stick at. It's typically the larger ones that fail. There are smaller ones all sort of around here. Those are on the five volt rail, but I have a feeling it's gonna be this one right here. I'm just trying to remove it from the board uh, without taking it out. It will operate, the machine will operate fine without this in place. Okay, let's see if the camera works anymore. It's blinking green. I think it's gonna work. All right, let's see if we get a hot spot now. Oh, we are still getting a hot spot. So that was not the problem. I'm actually wondering if the hot spot was one of the resistors that's down there. I wish I had a higher resolution camera. So I'm just gonna have to turn this on and see what gets hot. And you know, you can see all the ICs are getting hot, but we can see something over there is very, very hot. I think they're resistors to be honest. And let's see the temperature. Oh, it's only in the thirties. This IC here is pretty warm. Oh, the computer is booting obviously. And we can see on the disc drive here, there are things that are warm because that is powering up, but nothing is particularly hot. Let's check out the hot spots. No, not even 30 degrees. Unfortunately, you can only measure with this FLIR right in the middle. That's the only measurement point. So I cut that capacitor out, but the computer is working now and it's not shutting down. So what exactly is going on? Let's see if any of these chips are hotter than they should be. Everything looks completely fine. So my only idea is that the cap that I cut out over here was also getting hot, even though it was near those resistors, and I should have checked the temperature it was getting to because the computer's not turning off anymore. So what's going on here? I don't know. I'm gonna put it all together with the uh, video card so we can see what's going on. VGA card's back in. This power supply is connected to the motherboard and the disk drives. I don't have the disk controller card in. Look at that, it starts up. That, that capacitor, it had to have been the problem. It really had to have been the problem. I measured it on the multimeter and it was on the five volt rail incidentally. So I guess that cap was bad and it just happened to be near those resistors. It's ultra, which also got warm, but yeah, I'm, there's, there's no other explanation for this computer seemingly completely working at this point after I just cut that cap out. If it wasn't that cap, that was the problem. So we entered into basic here. It had an error for the keyboard and for the disk drive. So I'm just gonna connect those up and we'll see if these drives work. All right, drive controller is back in and I have an XT keyboard connected. Yes, this is actually an XT keyboard. Actually it's XT AT switchable, but I kind of like it because it feels very nice and it has a normal layout, which I prefer when I'm using an XT. All righty, let's turn this on. Okay, so it's still working, which means it wasn't one of the disk drives or the floppy controller, which was causing the machine not to boot. Okay, so it's trying to boot the A drive here. I'm gonna insert cleaning disc. I did just hear a weird sound out of it. Oh, I guess that was just the floppy drive. 
Let's see if the spindle turns. Yeah, that's turning. And this one was a little stuck, uh, but it's turning as well. Sometimes the bearings get a little crunchy in these things after not running for a very long time. So let's reboot this. Oh, it just shut off. Aha! So the problem is not totally fixed. Interesting. That is a bit suspect. Again, I think it still might be this power supply just being ever so marginal, but could be something is overheating still. I mean, I saw the drives powered up on the thermal camera and they were fine. I didn't see if this disc controller has a problem, but anyways, okay, kind of unusual. I don't think this is spinning. The, the belt is slipping on this drive. So I could hear that the spindle motor was turning, but this is a belt drive and the belt can definitely get dirty over time and then just slip on the spindle. It's a cloth impregnated rubber belt. So generally they don't break. You just need to give them a good cleaning and kind of scuff them up a little bit. So there's a good grip again and clean the pulleys as well, just to make sure that it's all turning. I could feel that the bearing, it's a little sticky in there. And again, very, very typical for these usually just operating them for a little bit kind of loosens up all the grease inside the bearings and stuff and gets the drives working again. So right now it is actually spinning and, but I can stop it pretty easily. So I'm just gonna keep hitting control delete to get that thing to spin and it should kind of gain more torque and be able to spin this cleaning disc. I'm just gonna see if it's now spinning. There we go, it's actually spinning that disc right now. So it's attempting to clean the actual heads, which is what I wanted it to do. Okay, what I have here is a copy of DOS 3.3. To be honest, I have no idea if this is enough memory to run DOS 3.3. Let's get this in the drive here, see if it works. It may require an older version of DOS or I'll have to find something, RAM card, to uh, add more memory to this. Let's see, will this actually boot? Nope, it is not working. I think this drive is just requires a full service. And to be honest, for this type of video, that's beyond the scope of this video. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grab a 360K drive here and we're just gonna unplug both of these because I'm sure both of them require a service because they're both dirty. And we'll just connect up this 360K drive after the twist. So the cable end that was plugged into that drive. And I will just take the power cable off of there and connect that up and we'll just put that on its side there and we'll insert this DOS 3.3 disk into this drive which I think I've tested and I know works. I have a 360 written on the side but I didn't draw a tick mark which is what I normally do to let me know that the drive has been tested and works. It showed a 601 error and that is because this expects two floppy drives and there's only one and it did not work. That could be that my disk is bad, but it also could be that there is insufficient memory for DOS 3.0 or 3.3 to work. Drives actually making weird noises. So when things don't work, grab another disk drive. I happen to have another 360K drive. So we'll try this other drive and see if that works a little bit better. I think there should not be any problem whatsoever uh, that the machine expects two floppy drives and there's only one. It should still try to boot off that main drive. Okay, so this is booting now. We see it moving the head there. That drive obviously also needs service. This is a TIAC 360K drive and I guess it doesn't work. So I need to make sure I draw a tick mark on this because it doesn't have a tick mark. And there we are, booted into DOS 3.3. And then definitely these two internal drives, they need some service. And there we have it, 256K total memory, and that much memory is free. So DOS 3.3 totally works. All right, so there we have it. 5150 is done. I'm gonna say this machine works. It doesn't seem to shut off anymore. It was shutting off, uh, it did that one time we saw on camera, but then I let it run for a good amount of time and there were no issues. It obviously needs that new tantalum capacitor or you know some capacitor reinstalled on that five volt spot over by the resistors. And then I'm gonna say both of these disk drives need servicing. I didn't test the B drive, but most likely it's in the same exact state as this one. Good cleaning usually is all it needs and then kind of exercise them, use them up a little bit, but the heads are probably really dirty and dusty because there was a lot of dirt in this entire machine. So it's probably oh, what's going on with these drives.
But anyhow, there we are. Pretty clean 5150 and um, nothing particularly interesting about this machine. So let's move on to the Precision XT clone. Let's open this up, see what we find inside. Does it have that accelerator that that sticker on the back indicated? This machine is missing two of its rubber feet on the bottom. So I'm just sticking a cloth there. So as I turn it around on the desk, it doesn't scratch it up. There's already enough scratches on this work surface. I don't need more from the screws on the bottom of this computer. Unlike the IBMs, this thing just uses normal Phillips head screws, which is kind of why I said I never used those two uh, nut driver things when I was working on old computers, because I basically always worked on clones. Okay, screws are out. Let's take a look at what's inside this machine together. If I can get this top to start sliding. Did I get all the screws out? Yes, they're all out. There we go. Just have to give it a little push on the front. What are we gonna find? All righty, well, we can see right off the bat there is an MFM hard drive and it's one I'm not familiar with by the looks of it. On initial inspection, we have a rather large video card. We do have uh, the floppy controller here, but sort of a multi IO card and it does have a CR2032 on there. Good sign, that means we shouldn't have a destroyed motherboard. This is the hard drive controller and then there's another card here which I don't know what this is. Um, it doesn't seem to uh, have any ports on the back nor any cables connected to it. Let's start on this furthest card here. This will be the video card, video and uh, parallel. Get this out. All right, well, this card here says it's a Hercules card. I don't know if this is an actual Hercules. Hercules computer technology. So I guess this is a real Hercules card. And what's kind of cool about that is I actually don't have any real Hercules cards. This will be my first one here. Sorry about the glare. So the neat thing about Hercules cards, of course, is that they use the regular MDA video output, so monochrome, but these are able to generate one bit graphics. So they actually have 64K of memory right here, which is incidentally MT branded. So that's not a good sign. Although the MT RAM that was on that other XT, they worked perfectly. It was actually the same series as this. 4264 and these are 15 nanoseconds. The ones that were on the 5150 were actually uh, 200 nanoseconds, but same part number. To do the special graphics modes, there is this custom ASIC here or whatever, this Hercules chip that sort of handles that. This is the CRTC controller, 6845 compatible, the Hitachi version. I think this is the character ROM right here. Of course, I said we have the video RAM 64K, so that supports the I think it's 720 by 350 is the graphics resolution at one bit color. I think it supports redefinable fonts, which might be this static RAM chip, lots of logic chips, and this does support parallel port as well. So some of this logic will be for that. Taking a quick look at Wikipedia for the Hercules graphics card, we can see here that this card came out in 1982. And a little tidbit says the founder of the company created the Hercules graphics card so he could work on his doctoral thesis on an IBM PC using the Thai alphabet, impossible with the low resolution CGA or fixed character set of the MDA. Initially, this card retailed for $499. And there it is, the actual resolution this card supports is 720 by 348. And the 64K of RAM on the card can actually hold two distinct graphics pages, so that helps with animation. The particular resolution used was very far from square pixels, but on a 4x3 monitor, Here's an image using dithering of how it would look actually displayed on a real CRT. Many monochrome video cards after this, well, EGA cards as well, emulated this Hercules graphics standard. And there are lots of pieces of software like Microsoft Windows early versions and Planet X3 and whatnot that ran on the Hercules card and did graphics using this card. Incidentally, I didn't mention this, but I can see that this is just a normal XT. There's no 286 board in here. If there were, we'd have a ribbon cable going down to the processor, which is right there. So yeah, it's kind of run of the mill. And I know you can't see it, but the RAM is right here on the motherboard and it does have 640K, nothing, nothing too special there. So let's look at this uh, multi IO card. Here it is. I think I actually have one of these already. So it's just a floppy controller and it has serial parallel and it also has a clock, of course, there it is. And it's not leaked because CR2032. I think this is a game port connector right here that is not used. 
And there is uh, another serial port header you'd have to populate this IC, which is a, a UART 8250. Maybe you'll remember this, but back in the day, these UARTs, these serial UARTs here, didn't have any kind of buffers in them. But there was a 16550, which was a drop-in replacement for these chips, which would give you buffered uh, serial port, I think up to 16 bytes of buffer, which was great if you were going at high speeds and the computer was busy writing to disk or whatever, you would lose characters at the high bit rates. But with 16550, that 16 bytes of buffer was all the difference. So these A250s, they are just the, the early versions. And like I said, it was a common, if you did a lot of high speed downloading and you had an ISA based system to upgrade to the 16550. Unfortunately, this is a soldered, so you can only do it on the second port here, but you just have a little header there to, uh, to do that. As far as this board goes, well, um, it says made in Taiwan, M10-100 or MIO-100. That's probably MIO, multi-IO-100. We have a serial number sticker there. We have two dip switch blocks. And is there anything else we can see on here? Maybe there's an FCC ID on the back. There is a sticker there. Very hard to read. It does say made in Taiwan, FCC ID E5Y6L9MIO100. So that's that model number we saw on the front again. Pretty typical for the XT days and just sucky that there was nothing written on the back. Like they didn't use silk screen markings. Not that there was space, this board is pretty packed to just tell you what these switches did. All right, next up is the hard drive controller, uh, MFM or RLL, I can't quite tell. I need to remove these cables because it looks like it's a Western Digital. It says right here, WDXT-Gen, WDC Corporation 1987. So yeah, definitely a Western Digital part, has Western Digital ICs on here. And as I talked about in my MFM hard drive video, like all XTs, it has to have a BIOS because the motherboard BIOS down there does not support hard drives out of the box. So the card has to do that work. Therefore, you have to have a BIOS that supports the particular hard drive you have. And I think this particular card is later, has 1987 date on here. Pretty sure that this uh, BIOS is a bit more fancy and it supports arbitrary hard drive types. So you're not limited to just like type two or something like that. You can actually type in the heads and cylinders. Luckily, these Western Digital cards are pretty well documented. This says it's the WXT Gen F300, as I mentioned, Rev X1. The fact that these are well documented means it's usually pretty easy to find the documentation, which is good if you have one of these and you're trying to get up and running. Okay, and here is the last card, which <laughs> that's really weird. It's just another clock card. This is a hyper clock card from Polaris Computers. This is a very simple card, as you can see. It has the clock chip right here, the power for it. There's the crystal oscillator, and then these will be select logic for the ISA bus so that you know this maps to a particular I.O. address, which is probably like 300. Very typical for these cards. On the back, it doesn't really say much. It is a little corroded, I have to say. That's interesting. What's the deal with this? This is actually flux residue like that was hand soldered. So that must have been some rework that was done at some point. But yeah, 74 LS 138, very typical select logic. Actually, these are both 138s. So yeah, this will be selected, uh, you know, at a particular base IO, but there are no jumpers. So there is no way to configure it. Why on earth is there one of these in here when the clock card also has a battery? What's the deal with that? As long as these aren't at the same IO address space, then that's not a problem. But maybe one of these is disabled and they couldn't get it working, so they just got this, or maybe this didn't work, so they got that. Who knows? I do know that these old batteries, there's no way they work, so I'm just gonna pop that out of there. You know what, maybe we should test them. Alrighty, starting with the battery that was on the clock card, the independent clock card, we are at, uh, well, it's sort of going up a little bit. <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna hit a whole 0.1 volts. Uh, yeah, obviously removing it from the load of the chip, caused it to kind of gain back some of its uh, some of its voltage. Oh, this one's actually at one volt. This is the Rayovac one. It was on the multi IO card. How fancy. And unfortunately I misplaced the other battery from the 5150, so I can't test that. But that thing was very bulged. There's no way that one works. Looking at the other parts in this machine, we have a Comtrade 150 watt power supply. We have a very typical run of the mill XT clone motherboard. I've definitely had some of these in the basement before. Notice it has a single ROM chip here instead of a full suite of EEPROMs, but that's because this supports multiple different EEPROM sizes. So 
that's understandable. These particular motherboards came in both a turbo variant and a non-turbo variant. So 4.77 megahertz for the non-turbo, and then the turbo is typically 8 and 4.777, or 4.77, <laughs> just two sevens. Uh, typically the clock generator stuff is up here on this motherboard, and I can see that there's the uh, this chip right here, which is an NEC version of the clock generator. I am pretty sure, almost positive, I repaired one of these motherboards on the channel before. I think it was like one of these ICs right here that was preventing the DMA from working properly. So as soon as you tried to boot off a floppy disk, you would get a crash. I noticed there's actually a jumper right here as well, which looks like the pins are bent together, but I don't think they're actually touching. So I don't know if that's like reset or that was a, a turbo switch that's just not connected. 640K of memory, we have a 512K right here, and then we have 128K in these two banks. Looking at the processor that's up here, I can see it's an 8088-2. So this is actually an eight megahertz part, which might imply this thing is actually turbo capable. And here's the MFM hard drive. It's actually made by NEC Corporation and part number D5126. And you can see right here, this uses a stepper motor, which is good sometimes because it means if it's jammed up, you can add a little bit of lubricant right there to get that thing moving, maybe. So I'm really glad to find that there was no corrosion in this machine and it's all pretty run of the mill parts though. So let's just give it the good old smoke test. I'm not gonna do it with the Hercules card. I know I tested the power supply on the 5150 before powering it up, but that's because that was a genuine IBM motherboard and this is, this is a clone motherboard. So this is not as like valuable, so to speak. Okay, so it turned on, that sounds good. Let me grab the multimeter. I should have done that at least. All right, here we go. All right, five point Okay, well, it's a little unstable, I gotta say, but that could easily be because there is still insufficient load on this thing without other peripherals like the hard drive. So let's just check the 12 volt rail on here and then I'm gonna plug the hard drive in. Hopefully that spins. Okay, 13. It is a little high, but that's probably completely fine because if you think about it, it's 12 volts plus or minus 10%. So that's up to 13.2 uh, volts. It was definitely posting properly, which is what those beeps were all about. So the VGA card's in, the monitor's connected, and the hard drive is connected, so it made that clack noise, and it's spinning up. Excellent, so it does not have stiction. So we got the monitor turned on. It says XT BIOS Copyright Award Software, Better Products Incorporated. Was that the label that was on the front of the machine? I know it's hard to read this monitor. It's old and it's pretty dim. Uh, it's counting up the memory. I don't have the hard drive controller plugged in, so it's not gonna actually boot, and nor is the floppy drive, of course. It is doing the memory check, though, and hopefully that is visible. It does say 640 memory, good, and 601, which is, the, I think, uh, the keyboard error. Press F1 to continue. All right, let me put in the rest of the cards and see if this thing boots up on this hard drive, which I gotta say is not very noisy. This is a pretty quiet MFM hard drive, and I did sound like it seeked a little bit, so let's turn that off. Yep, I heard it kind of park itself. Alrighty, all the cards are reinstalled. Why is it beeping so annoyingly? <laughs> That's the thing I worry about. It is counting up the memory. That that triple beep at power on is a little weird sounding. I would I would think that's an error, not normal behavior. Is the floppy drive gonna work? The light came on. Well, that's something but is the hard drive working? That is the question. All signs point to probably it's not working because it's just sitting here. Now, there's not gonna be any kind of a basic in this particular computer. It has an award BIOS, so there's no, no IBM basic, which means it should just say boot error. Remember that on XT machines like this, they do not have postcodes. So you can't put in one of those postcards in here and expect to see any numbers displayed on there. You could check the voltage rails are good, but you definitely can't check that you have executing code and a BIOS. Obviously the fact that the monitor turns on means that it is executing. The system is just sitting here doing nothing. The floppy light is on. Doesn't seem like it's trying to do anything. I'm assuming the hard drive controller is trying to boot off this hard drive. So I don't think that's gonna work in this video. So I'm gonna turn the power off. We're just gonna pull the hard drive controller out of here. In fact, I'm gonna pull the power out of the drive as well since I don't need that spinning if this drive does work. Oh, so I'm noticing when the floppy drive spins up, the fan slows down on this. So this power supply is not a good power supply and it clearly needs a load. Oh, there it says insert system disc. It needs a load on the 12 volt rail for you to actually have um, a decent control there. 
Let me clean the disc a little bit. At least it's spinning. So we'll just sort of let that do a cleaning cycle. So with a lot of these power supplies, they regulate the five volt rail and the other rails, like the positive and the negative rails and the 12 volt rail is derived from the five volt rail. So as you load down the five volt rail, it has to increase the duty cycle, which can, can cause the 12 volt rail to rise up. So it might be in like the 13 volt range, which is why this fan is running so quick. As soon as you load down the 12 volt rail though with the disc drive, then it brings that rail down because it's just a transformer with some diodes and stuff like that, which is why the fan keeps changing speed. This is a really crap power supply and uh, well, you know, this whole computer is a cheap clone thing. With the hard drive in there and working, it's probably fine, but without the hard drive, that 12 volt rail is unloaded unless the floppy drive is spinning. All right, so in with the same DOS 3.3 disc that we were using on the other machine. And let's hit enter and see if it's booting. It is actually booting. So this floppy drive works, unlike the other two. So there we are, we're actually booted up into DOS. I'm gonna put in my XT IDE card though, so we can actually get this thing loading with some software because obviously this uh, 360K disc doesn't really have anything on it. And let's be honest, we wanna know how fast this computer is and I'll be able to tell with my XT IDE with the software on there. Now it is DOS 622 on here, so you really need 640K for it to work properly. So I couldn't have stuck this into the 5150, although it's a 5150, it's running at 4.77 megahertz. It's all just run of the mill stuff there. All right, so this didn't even show the XT IDE uh, startup information. And I, I'm not exactly sure why that is. It just, could just be a bad connection in this slot here. I just moved into another slot. So let's see if that helps. I also removed the uh, multi IO card because maybe there was a conflict there. I wouldn't be with the ROM BIOS, but maybe the base IO of 300, I think this is set to, might be conflicting with, uh, with that card for the clock or something like that. We should see, okay, that's fine. We hit F1. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's working. So yeah, 300 and I changed the uh, ROM to be a D000. So that's gonna boot up. Let's load up, check it here. This will tell us how fast this particular computer is. Ah, 4.77 megahertz. So this thing is definitely no turbo. So it's gonna be exactly XT speeds. And it shows up as 0 0.98, so a little bit slower for whatever reason. Some of these motherboards, you can hit Control, Alt, and Plus. And it gave us two beeps. I think that's just check it making that beep sound. That would change it to turbo speed. But running this again, and we're still at 4.77 megahertz. So there's no turbo action on this machine. Alrighty, that's going to be it for the Precision XT. Here's my note on it. XT 4.77 megahertz. It works. 640K. 360K floppy drive and a multi IO. I did actually remove the hard drive, which is right here because I'm gonna do future testing on this to see if I can get it worked. That'll have to be in a different video. But for now, I just left everything else inside this machine that was in here. So I'll just stick that note there and let's grab the final machine. All right, the final XT clone. I'm gonna try to move quickly through this one because uh, videos, <laughs> as usual for me, is getting very long. But yeah, this thing, hopefully this thing will have something interesting in it, or maybe it will have a working hard drive. I have to say, you know, these XT clone machines, back in the day, they were just absolutely everywhere, and they were just complete commodity equipment. The parts were plentiful, they were cheap, there was really no reason why anyone should buy an IBM like PCXT versus one of these clones, especially later on. Oh, I didn't mention on the last motherboard from that middle machine we just worked on, it had a date code, well, a handwritten note on there of 1988. So someone bought that thing in 1988 and they probably really didn't pay very much money for that. I think by 1988, the 3D6 was available. So an XT would have been a very slow machine, especially a non-turbo one. It's kind of unusual, to be honest, that that isn't a faster computer, but it could be that one of those jumpers on there would actually make that thing fast and it just wasn't set, but that's the way that machine was used. It was just used with no turbo. So I guess whoever was using it was just running like word perfect or whatever, and they didn't need more speed. But really what I was saying is that these XT clone machines they were just so commodity and they were really boring. Most of these just have exactly the same stuff in there to make this thing just a basic PC that you could run basic DOS programs on because ultimately that's what people wanted to do and they didn't want to spend a whole lot of money 
And this was a way to be able to run those same programs you would work, use at work, Lotus 123, WordPerfect, things like that, on a very inexpensive computer that you had at home. Alrighty, so let's crack this open. This is the one that had all that dog hair in the back. Is there gonna be anything interesting in here? It does not look like it. This thing looks completely run of the mill. Yeah, this thing is absolute bare bones basic. So we have a video card that is also multi IO. It's got the serial ports on it. It's got kind of everything on it. And then we have the hard drive controller. Let me yank those out so we can see what these are. This machine here is sporting the Leadman model PC-130A DC output, 150 watts. Again, these were all clones of the original IBM PC-5150 and 5160 power supply, and they were as commodity cheap things as you can get. I mean, all these brands are things you've never heard of. Who knows how good quality these are, although they generally seem to work this many years on, so that's something. All right, I've released the screws, and let's see what we got here. So a very long full length multi IO card here and it does have the clock battery, but again, it's a Rayovac uh, 2032 or actually it's a 2325. So um, nice, no leakage in any of these machines. How excellent is that? This particular card says Diamond Pack Rev2 made in Taiwan. It has video display here. So there's a Fujitsu chip here and this will be the video output display processor. MB672312U, 1987 date code. And then we have a 6845 CRTC controller right here. And this is an 82C11. So this is for the parallel port. So this is the video card right here. Uh, let's see where the memory is. Here it is right here, 4164. So this card right here has actual 64K of RAM on it. Well, let's see, this could be a CGA card, but it could also actually be a monochrome like Hercules type card because that also has 64K on it. This only has two chips, but these are later chips where they're four bits wide. It's actually hard to know if this is a monochrome or CGA card. It could be both actually because the connector here is the same. And there are some jumpers right up here. So it may actually do them both. I have some cards that are like just single use uh, video and parallel cards. They're about this big, like this part right here, if you cut the card right there. And they do CGA, monochrome, Hercules, they kind of do everything. But I'm gonna guess by the 64K here that this is probably monochrome Hercules compatible and you know, maybe CGA, but who knows. And the next card here, the hard drive controller, and I did take out the screw, there it is, it just stuck a little bit. I'm gonna guess this is Western Digital based on the gold color. And it is not, this is an Adaptec card of some kind. Well, the BIOS chip here says 408100, but I'm not seeing actually a part number. Normally, adaptive cards are AIC and then something. The back has a date code, 8739th week. There's a part number, 207-00, Rev B. That doesn't really tell us much at all. And the Adaptec logo is down here. It might be when we turn this computer on, it will actually give us the uh, banner for this BIOS chip, which will tell us which model it is. It is actually hard to tell when you look at these if this is an RLL controller or an MFM controller because it could be either and they both have the same interface cables. Looking at the motherboard, well, we know this is a Turbo XT because it has a turbo light and switch and uh, there are two connectors right here or three connectors. So that's the reset switch, whoops, turbo switch. And then uh, the turbo light, I'll just plug those back in where they were. This computer has 640K of memory, so we have 512K right here, and then we have four chips here that make up the extra 128K. I do see down there, you're not gonna be able to see very easily, but there is the processor, it's an 8088-2, although it's an NEC variant. It is not a V20 though, it is just an 8088. And I do see a label down there between the slots that says 10 megahertz turbo board. The motherboard looks like it's a little bit more spacious than normal, but I think that's mostly due to the fact that it's got this 128K right here, which is made up of these four chips versus the normal 16. Unfortunately, we can't get a good look at the hard drive, but I can see that it is not uh, a Seagate drive. I think it's a mini scribe, five and a quarter inch drive. So uh, let's put this thing back together and let's see if it powers up and works. Maybe we'll get a booting system, one that will actually boot off the hard drive. Oh, I just realized I can't have this in there because I got to run it off VGA. So I guess we won't have a floppy. All righty, so let's see what happens. There we go. Start it right up. Does sound unhappy with those beep codes, though. On the other hand, we actually have a working BIOS. It's in 40 columns, but 
640K, Keyboard Air, KMK Corp, Computer 6408. The hard drive is not spinning and we're getting a beep code on the front. So that would be yet another MFM hard drive that doesn't work. So I'll take this out of here and I'll have to work on this on another video. But on the screen, we see 1701 error. That's the hard drive controller card giving that disk error. Yeah, of course. So that is kind of obvious. So yet another failed MFM hard drive. What else is new, honestly? It's probably gonna be hard to see, but there is the Miniscribe hard drive right there. I can just see their logo and the word Miniscribe. So it's a five and a quarter inch Miniscribe. I don't think I've ever had one of those work, although maybe I do have one that works, but very, very unreliable. At least we know it's not a brick. Looks like someone stuck the heads and cylinders bad map on the side here. And when this drive was new, it didn't have any. Hmm. All right, here we go again. The XT IDE is in. I have the hard drive controller out along with the video card. So we have VGA and XT IDE, just like in the last one. Turn this on. Musical power up tones. Now the fact that it's in 40 column mode, that is gonna be um, probably something to do with the dip switch settings and maybe it is CGA, okay, at least we're getting the uh, XTIDE here. Once it boots into DOS, we can switch it over to 80 column mode, no problem. So you type mode CO80, and then we're gonna go into 80 column mode. There we are. Alrighty, running check it as we were before. Alrighty, so this machine is running in 4.77 megahertz, but it's almost understandable because I manipulated the turbo buttons when I was you know, showing off these computers originally. So let's push the turbo button and there it is. It is now green, which is, should be running in 10 megahertz. Even though the switch is an on off switch, it is not momentary. It's actually not really possible to tell which way is in and which way is out. But clearly with the light on, it means turbo, which means this thing is gonna run at 10 megahertz or it should at least. So before I rerun this, 337 dry stones, 6.5K whetstone, so 0.98 times the XT speed. Let's run this again and let's see what kind of a boost you get. So we're getting 10 megahertz there, excellent. Yeah, 717 dry stones, 13.9K whetstones, over two times the speed, which makes sense because the clock speed should scale linearly on these old systems. I don't think these are doing any kind of weight states or anything like that. There are no, the chipset doesn't support that kind of thing. So it's just running everything a whole lot faster. On the original XT, the ISA bus is locked to the CPU frequency, but probably has a divider on here. Otherwise it would kind of overclock cards and stuff. But yeah, that's a pretty nice performance boost. As I had mentioned when I was first looking at the outside of this machine, the case design was very reminiscent of the AT, which is sitting right there, which would imply that this thing would be a little bit faster than the original XT. But when you look at those performance metrics, an actual AT is more than two times faster even though the AT, the original one runs at six megahertz and then the later 5170s ran at eight. And then of course there were turbo clones and stuff like that. The performance improvement on the 286 just due to the 16 bit bus and plus the more efficient uh, instructions for clock, stuff like that, increases the speed more than two times. But nonetheless, this is still a full two times faster than the original XT, which is pretty nice. And as a bonus, the thing works. I realize now that I did not test the floppy drive. So let me put this multi IO card back in the machine so we can at least uh, see if this thing can boot to DOS 3.3 from this. And let's see if the reset button works. That does. It's so noisy at power on. Why is it doing all those beeps when seemingly it has no actual errors? So I'm gonna use this ISA floppy controller card here. So it says non-system disk, it did seek the drive. So we'll just do the old quick cleaning as usual here. Oh, what's happening here? There's already a disk in the drive. I was like, what's happening? Anyhow, put in the cleaning disk. Okay, in with my DOS 3.3 disk and the system is booting. So there we go. Mode CO80 to get out of this 40 column mode. If you wanna go back to 40 column mode, incidentally, you type mode CO40, and that goes back into 40 column mode. It's useful if you have a CGA video card and you're hooked up to a composite monitor and you wanna have more readable text. Let's see if the disc that was in the drive is actually readable. And yes, there it is. Uh, pick1.jpg and test.jpg? 
No one was looking at JPEGs on an XT. I don't even think there's any viewers that would work. Maybe there is, but I am unaware of it and it's gonna be so unbelievably slow. And I don't think this HD test has anything to do with that. I think that has to do with the hard drive. Let's run HD test. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, well that didn't work, did it? I took a look at these files here, these George V and then George V without the E, and these appear to be some personal kind of letter or something like that, and so I'm not gonna show that. It's funny though, look at that, the dates. 1996? Who exactly was using this computer in 1996? And were they trying to look at JPEGs? Because that is not gonna work. I went ahead and I copied those JPEG files off of the floppy disk and onto my modern computer here. And one of them actually works. And it's, uh, well, it's X-rated, so I can't show it. And what we have here, which was one of the other ones, that had .jpg extension, is actually UU encoded information. And it looks like it's probably from Usenet. There was another file in there with a .back extension, and it actually looked like it was a download from Usenet. So someone had grabbed an X-rated picture off there, decoded it, and for some reason it was stored on a 360K drive. Maybe there was some kind of JPEG viewer that took 20 minutes to display a single JPEG on that XT. I don't know. Before I put this computer back together, I'm just going to remove this MFM hard drive since it's not spinning. And maybe I can get it working in another video. So let's uh, see this drive, what it looks like. And there we have it, a mini scribe drive with a date code of uh, 18th of June, 1987. And here's the synopsis for this final machine. So Turbo XT, 10 megahertz, 640K, 360K drive works. And I did remove the hard drive, so it will need a hard drive to do anything. <laughs> and that is gonna be it for this video. So we looked at three computers here. They are all XT or PC compatible machines. Of course, the top one here is the IBM PC 5150, which is the machine that absolutely started it all. IBM very quickly went from this to the 5160, the XT, and that is what all of these clone machines are based on. And even today in 2023, there are little bits of this computer's architecture embedded into the chipset on your motherboard to emulate various things like timers and IRQs and things like that, that this machine is what established. So it's pretty cool that this thing was the start of it all. And then you could see that very quickly, the clones took over. There are some really good documentaries out there about how IBM lost control of the PC market, and it was really the reverse engineering of their BIOS code, which was really the only copyrighted thing on this. They designed it to be an open system, an open platform. So once the BIOS code was reverse engineered and MS-DOS was sold by Microsoft to whoever wanted it, well, you had clone machines like these. The fact that all three of these machines were relatively uninteresting just sort of belies the fact that these were commodity machines, especially these later XT clones. They're very, very rarely interesting because they had gotten very cheap and they were just bought for people to use WordPerfect and do simple word processing and stuff like that at home. They had hard drives in them, which is what we have here, the two that were out of those two machines that don't work. The hard drives have died, but I bet you if we had these working, we would just find WordPerfect, a Lotus 123, that kind of thing on them. Basic, basic stuff, because these were just basic computers. Anyhow, if you like this video, like I said, thumbs up. Thanks to my patrons, their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Patrons get early access to videos, but even the higher tiers get some behind the scenes footage and pictures and other posts that I put up there, including uh, an upcoming live stream, which I'm gonna be testing out, my very first live stream. So if you're a patron and you're one of the higher tiers, uh, watch for that. I did put a post on my Patreon page today about it. If you haven't subscribed to my channel already, I really appreciate it if you would hit that subscribe button and also do that on the second channel. It really, really helps me out. And I think I've gone on for long enough. So thanks very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.